Praise the Lord. Wow, God is so good. Yep, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Going to be focusing on verse 10. We've been talking about the amazing grace of God. We all know that we're here and we have right standing with God only because of His grace. It's not because of the good works that we have done. It's not because of the bad works that we have done, but it's because of His grace. It's all about Him. It's all about the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And we're so blessed. Amen? Amen. Yeah. You know, you hear me say all the time that God has a purpose and plan for each one of us. And He started that purpose and plan and put it into place before the foundation of the earth. You guys ever heard me say that? No? Never? Right? Yeah. All the time. You know, it's so it's, it's foundational for me because... <laughs> I mean, what greater promise do we have in life than to know that God has had it all planned out from the beginning? That you don't have to worry about the things that you're going through, that anything that you're going through right now, God already has the resolution planned out. He already knows what's going to happen because he's planned that from the beginning. And so for those of you who have heard me say that, today is your day because I'm going to give you the verses. <laughs> I know you guys have thought that, like, where is that in the Bible? Well, today I will show you. I'll give you just a snippet because it's everywhere. But you know, it's like, uh, what do you call it, Marissa? Like the, the law of attraction or something like that. Like once you, once you see it, then you're going to see it everywhere because it's all throughout the scriptures. And one of them is right here in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let's read starting in verse 8. It says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, here it is, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Praise the Lord. God, what can we say? We serve a God who is incredible, who is amazing, who is all-powerful, who is mighty. God, words can't even begin to describe. I feel like all that was such a disservice to you and who you are. God, you are so much greater than we can even imagine. And we just stand in awe of you, Lord. And what you have done in our lives here and what you have done in all the world and all the universe since you created it, Lord. We thank you. Would you speak here now? Would it not be of me, God? Would it not be of any of us? but would you speak to each and every heart as you have prepared? We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. What a blessing to know that God has a specific plan for each one of us, right? And that plan was given to each one of us before the foundation of the earth. It says before time began. Do you guys know what started time? You know when God put the earth into place? It says he spun it like a top. And the sun, moon, and the stars he put into place too. Do you know that is when time began? Because you know the sun going up and the sun going down? That's the only thing we judge time upon. So without that, without God doing that, there was no time. And so when he says before time began, you understand when he had a plan for this place, when he had a plan for this universe, he was thinking of you too. He had a plan for everything that was going to go on in your life, too, at that time. Isn't that amazing? That blows my mind. That blows my mind. But you know that God is still working out that great plan in each one of our lives today. Even though he planned it way back then, he's still doing it today. God is actively involved in every single one of our lives. It's not like he just threw it all into place and planned it out and then said, oh, have fun, good luck out there. No, no, no. He is actively involved. He is doing everything for you moment by moment. You know that he's the one who makes your heart beat every single time? 
He's the one who gave you that breath that you just took. He didn't say, oh, like, go for it, see what happens. No, he's actively doing it in each one of our lives. That's the God that we serve. And that's why for me, this is, this is a side note, okay? Let me just preface it with this. This is a freebie, okay? For me, to think evolution or even old, old earth Christianity, it's so bogus. It really is. Old earth Christianity, meaning like God created something at the beginning, and then it took billions of years for it to evolve into what it is now, okay? Look, God said he created the earth in seven days. He said, on the first day, there was evening and there was morning. And that was day one, right? It's not like, oh, a day is like a thousand years. Yeah, to God it is in heaven. But look, a day is a day when there's evening and there's morning, right? I just told you time, that's how time goes, evening and morning. Well, excuse me, for us, it goes morning and evening. But for the Jews, you know that they do, they do that, their calendar, their day starts at night. It's evening and then morning because that's how God created it. Fascinating, right? But look, to have this idea that God created all this and then just said, oh, okay, now I'll just leave it to its natural processes and go have fun and survival of the fittest. Look, that's not the God we serve. If you read this gigantic book that he gave us, you will see he has never done things that way. Never. He has always been intimately involved in everyone's life. He works individually in each one of us. Why? Because he has an individual plan for you and an individual purpose for you. Yes, he works all things out in the entire universe. He makes it all happen, absolutely. But he also knows you personally. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows the things that you're going through. And let me tell you, he already has the solution worked out. He does. Because the things that he's doing here in each one of our lives, this, this here, this is, this is a, a training ground. This is a training ground for what God has for you. Because his plan that started before time began will go on for all of eternity as well. Because it doesn't just stop. When you die here, when you leave this place and you get to go be with him, his plan for you didn't just stop. No, no, this is a training ground for what he has for you there. Because for all of eternity, he has a plan for your life. Do you think heaven's gonna be boring? Come on. You know, his word tells us that at the end of the age, at the end of the great tribulation, there's gonna be a millennial reign of Christ that he's gonna set up where he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. That is the Jerusalem that is in Israel now. He will rule and reign from that Jerusalem for a thousand years here on the earth. And he says that us, his saints, will rule and reign with him. He says that we will judge the angels. Isn't that fascinating? The angels that he created that are doing his will right now he says, because you have gone through all of this and you have proven yourselves worthy, that is to stay with him, you now have the right to rule and reign with Christ because he has given you that right. Incredible, right? Incredible. You see, just in that millennial reign where he rules and reigns here from the earth, you know, there's still gonna be regular people here too. Like, yeah, we're gonna be in glorified, whether we die before the rapture or we're taken to the rapture or whatever, or the tribulation saying is like, we're, we're going to be in our glorified state at that time. But there will also be people who made it through the tribulation who are just regular people like us. You know, it says two thirds of the earth is going to, two thirds of the population of the earth is going to die. It says that people will be as rare as the gold of Ophir, fine gold. You know, like Solomon, when he was reigning, he sent ships to Ophir, and they came back with fine gold. Okay, that's the Ophir that we're talking about. That's the gold of Ophir that we're talking about. Not, not this one here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> kind of led right into that. All right. 
Yeah. We used to live there, though. I'm sure I should have gone gold panning when I was there. I never even thought about it. You know how, like, when you live in a place, you never think of the things you could do in that place. You're always thinking about somewhere else that you could do something, right? We, we came from the Bay Area. We almost never went to San Francisco. People come from across the world to go to San Francisco. We were like half an hour from there, and we never went. It's like, not that we were missing anything, but we never went anyway, right? Isn't that funny? Okay, that was another freebie. That was just a side note. Okay. Sorry, that's what my, my brain does. Just goes, just goes. But it says that people on the earth will be rarer than the gold of Ophir by the end of the tribulation. And that this place, the earth, you know how it says at the beginning, he spun it like a top. Did I just say that before? Yeah, spun it like a top. That's what scripture says. It says God took the earth and he spun it like a top. But eventually that top is going to slow down. And it says that the earth in Isaiah, it tells us that the earth will wobble like a drunken man. And the sun, the moon, and the stars will all melt in their places. They will be no more by the end of the tribulation. But then when Jesus comes back for a second coming, He's going to renew the earth for the millennial reign, that kingdom that we talked about, the thousand-year reign, okay? Now, all this to say that that thousand-year reign here on the earth, God has a purpose for you in that thousand-year reign because there's going to be other people here for that thousand-year reign. There's going to be regular people just like we are now. But you will be in your glorified state, and he has a plan for you in that glorified state to do his work. I love how sovereign God is, too, because he says even when he rules and reigns from Jerusalem for that thousand years, he says there'll be kings on the earth because he says if a king does not bring tribute into Jerusalem for the Lord, that he won't send rain on his land. Isn't that incredible? That is the sovereignty of God. Let's show that verse. Gary, I think it's on uh, slide four, if I'm not mistaken. He makes the rainfall and the just and the unjust. No. Okay, maybe I was wrong. Go to the one before that, I think. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, Matthew 5. This is what God says that he does. Okay, Jesus here in Matthew 5 is talking about how gracious God is to the earth. Even though people don't love him here, even though people say he's, fake and they go against him and all those things. Jesus tells us that God does this anyway. It says, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, the rain fall on the just and the unjust. You see how gracious God is? That even people that say he doesn't exist still get the sunrise every morning. They still get the rain in its season. That is the graciousness of God. You know why he said this? He says, paraphrasing, God is gracious like this, so you also should be gracious. That's what he's saying. Be like your heavenly father. It's powerful, so powerful. God has a plan for us, and in that plan, he is still working out exactly his purpose and his perfect will in the whole scenario. God is actively involved in everything that happens on the earth. The sun doesn't rise by natural processes. The rain doesn't fall by natural pro pro Remember that song? Evaporation, condensation. I know the hand gestures too. Condensation, precipitation, we know all three. You guys were never taught that song? Okay, we must be from a different generation here. Or I just had a better kindergarten teacher than you, maybe. <laughs> I still remember it now, right? It must have been good. It's a good way to learn, I guess, by song. <laughs> anyway, it, it seems like they're trying to say that, like, just happens naturally. Like, it just, the earth just does that. The atmosphere just makes it happen. Look, God is the one doing that. God is the one that makes the rainfall in its season. It doesn't just happen. This isn't just a natural process. God didn't just like set it up billions of years ago and say, here you go. No, he is actively involved. 
And that's why if you read the scriptures, it's clear. God made the earth in seven days. Matter of fact, it wasn't even seven days. It was six days, and he took a nap on the seventh day. He didn't even need all seven. God is that powerful. He just spoke, and it came to be. Wow. Do you think seeing everything that God has done, that he is not actively and intimately involved in your life in the same way? Do you think that God isn't with you like that? If he would do it for the universe, surely he would do it for you, who is more important. You know, the scriptures tell us that heaven and earth will pass away. This place that we're on now, it's going to be gone. It's not eternal like you are. You're an eternal being. And God has an eternal plan, an eternal plan for your eternal being. Okay? You're eternal. He's got an eternal plan for you. And that plan, he's had since the very beginning. Yeah. You know, all of this, all this plan, everything that God has done, it all points back to him. You know this book that we have? We call the Bible. You know, much of this was given directly to the Jews, his chosen people. And yet, even though they have that, even though they have the Old Testament the, in its entirety, yeah, there's some Orthodox Jews that stick to just the law of Moses, the first five books. But by the time Jesus was here on earth, the entire Old Testament was in publication. They had it. And yet, even though all of that pointed to him, they still didn't understand who Jesus was when he was here. They still didn't understand what he was doing. Fascinating, right? They had it all. And yet they thought they were looking for a different Messiah. They were looking for a, a, a governmental military leader who would overthrow the Romans and take them out of slavery. Look. Some of us are physically slaves. Some of us are physically free. We would consider ourselves physically free here in this country. But none of us are spiritually free. Jesus said, he who sins is a slave to sin. We're a slave to ourselves because it's our own sin that we're a slave to, to our own desires. And so when Jesus was here, his plan, yeah, I mean, there's some physical slavery that's been taken out of the way because of what Jesus has done, but he was here for spiritual slavery. He was here to set you free from spiritual slavery, that you wouldn't have to be a slave to your sin anymore, that you wouldn't have to be a slave to yourself anymore. That was his plan. And you know, it says that at his crucifixion, when he gives up his spirit and he says it is finished, a great earthquake happened in all the land. And then the veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy place, the sanctuary from the holy of holies, it was torn in two, signifying that we now had the direct opportunity to go right into the throne room of God, into his presence, and be with him for, amen, yeah. There's a guy who gets it in the back, yeah. Right into the presence of God. And we had no intermediary, no man except for Jesus who did it for us. You can, I mean, Greg, you get it, look. Look, you can go right into the presence of God, right? I think you get it because you've been there, you know? Like when you're in prayer, man, it's like God just does something. Like his, his spirit and his presence is there. 
And man, if you haven't experienced that, like you, there's, nothing, there's nothing else like it. There's nothing on earth like being in the presence of God. I was so sad. Remember I told you, um, I don't know, maybe a month or, so ago, month or so ago about this vision that God gave me when I was praying, of course. I was praying and God gave me this vision and he took me into the throne room of God into this like just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful room. The most brilliant, beautiful, I, I mean, I don't even know. I don't have the words to describe it. It was just incredible. I could see the throne of God and just his presence was there. Just, just As beautiful as this room was, like his presence was just like, it was like light in the darkness. It really was. And I was just thinking about that this morning as I was praying. And I was just telling the Lord, like, Lord, like, I, I, I've seen it. Like, I just, when I leave here, like, when you're done with me here, I just want to be there with you. Like, I just want to be in your presence, and that's all I want to do. Like, if I was just there for all eternity, that would be fine. Like, that's what I want to do. And he was like, no, I have something else for you. And I was like, oh, bummer. <laughs> that's really how I felt. I was like, oh, bummer. But, you know, in his own purpose and plan, he has something different for me. In all of eternity, he has something different for me. Maybe one of you guys will get to be there. I don't know. That would be sweet. I would be envious of that. <laughs> but you see, like, God's purpose and plan for our lives is sovereign over everything. And it's going to go on and on and on and on and on and on all the way till it never ends. I'll give you a couple more seconds. You got to understand, all the way until it never ends. Woo! You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm serious, though. Like, you can't even say all the way until the end because it never ends. God has this amazing, amazing, amazing plan for us all to be there with him when it never ends. It's going to be awesome. You know, I was mentioning how all of Scripture points to Jesus. I mean, think, think about it. Like the law of Moses, the rock of Horeb, the, the rock that gave water to the Israelites in the desert. It points to Jesus. Like the priesthood, the temple. He said all those things are pictures of heavenly things. Like God is trying to show us here that it's about him. That all this he has had planned out and he is working and moving in it. And he will continue to do it until his plan is completely fulfilled. Here's another verse from uh, Hebrews 10. He's quoting Jesus and he says, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book, in the entirety of the book. It was written of me to do your will, O God. That's Jesus' heart. The book in its entirety is written about him. To do the will of God, to complete the will of God. Let me give you these verses because I forgot and I went by it. These are the verses, these are some of the verses that talk about God having this plan before the foundation of the earth, okay? Here's one from Ephesians 1. This is gonna be the first slide, Gary. Gary is like, He's got to be on it because you see me and like, I just went all over the place with you guys. <laughs> now we're back to square one, okay? Ephesians 1 and verse 3, it says this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Next one in Matthew 25, it's Jesus speaking. He says, then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Go all the way to the end of the book in Revelation. I messed this one up, but I'll give it to you anyway, because I'll explain it after. It's Revelation 20, verse 14. It says, then death and Hades, this is at 
the end of the millennial reign. This is great white throne judgment stuff here. Right before new heavens and new earth. It says, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know that book of life that he's talking about? If you read, I think it's Revelation 13. It talks about it. And Revelation 17 for those who are writing this down. So it's Revelation 13, 17, and 20 where he talks about this foundational plan that he has. He talks and says that uh, those who are with him, their names are written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. And those who weren't, I think he actually does it in the opposite way. Those whose names weren't found written in the book of life before the foundation of the earth. Anyway, so he's saying like, this stuff, it's from the beginning. God has had this plan. And now he's actually working it out. Okay? All right. Let's go back to where I was. So, the Jews had this book, had the entire New Testament, or excuse me, the entire Old Testament, and yet they didn't see Jesus in it. You know, the Old Testament is the first five books of the Law of Moses, okay? And then you have what are known as the poetic books, the Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and then the the, uh, prophetic books after that, okay? Now, all of these things were together in their entirety, and they all point to the same thing. You know where I told you about the law of Moses? That's at the very beginning, okay? That's the first five books. And then you have the rock of Horeb as the Israelites are coming out of Egypt. That is pointing to Jesus too. You know how Moses struck the rock once and the water came out, but then it stopped and he came and he struck the rock again. And Jesus said, or excuse me, and God said uh, to Moses, now you can't go into the promised land because you messed up my picture. The picture is you strike the rock once and then you can speak to the rock. See, God was making a point through Moses. Crucifixion for Jesus, dying for our sin, it was a one-time thing. And when he says to tell us die at the end, it is finished, that means it's over. You don't die a million times for all the sins. No, Jesus was the perfect and spotless lamb who died once for all sin. And guess what it says about the lamb? Does anybody know this? Oh, trivia time. Look at this. Jesus was the lamb who was slain when? What is it? Yes. Jesus is the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth. You see, God's plan was to kill Jesus and that he was going to die for our sin before the foundation of the earth. It was over. It was done. Yet, so many, even Jews today, still don't believe it. They're his chosen people. And they still, well, I should say they, most of them choose not to believe it. Because you know Isaiah 53, that chapter that says uh, he was uh, bruised for our iniquities, he was crushed for our sins, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. That chapter. You know that is the, uh, that is a forbidden chapter to the Jews. That means they're not allowed to read it. Isn't that fascinating? In the prophets. Isaiah 53. Yeah, that's the forbidden chapter to the Jews because they all know it points directly to Jesus. It's fulfilled and could have only been fulfilled by him. And yet the Jews are still looking for their Messiah. First of all, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. Along with all of the genealogies that were kept in the temple from all people because they were told to keep the genealogy so they could know when the Messiah was there because it was very specific, right? Tribe of Judah from the line of David, like it it had to be them. It couldn't be anybody else. And they don't have those now. So how could they know who the Messiah is if they don't have the genealogies? You know, it's even difficult for them today to figure out who's Jewish and who's not. Because that land over there in Israel that people are fighting over right now, that's 
God's land for the Jews for all eternity. That is their promised land. And that's why the genealogies are so important. Because, I mean, obviously God is going to work this all out. Okay, this is a God thing. But they're trying to separate lands there now, but they're having a hard time because they don't know who's Jewish and who's not. They don't have genealogy, so you somehow have to prove that. And you don't get to unless your family somehow kept track for all these years. You see, all this just points to the fact that they're doing whatever they can to say that Jesus is not their Messiah when they know he is. Jesus said to Caiaphas, the high priest, who ordered his crucifixion, he said, you will not see me again until you see me coming on the clouds of heaven and you will weep for me as one weeps over a firstborn son. Why? Because they will know who he is and they will know that they are the ones that killed him. They killed their own Messiah. They killed the one that they were looking for all those years. But they killed him because they didn't want him. They killed him because they wanted religion. They wanted power. They didn't want a relationship with God. Look, by God's grace, I don't even know what to call this church, but it will never be a religion. Yeah, we're Christians. I'll I'll tell that, and I'll say that loud and proud. I mean, if you go down to the basics of the word, like, we are people that follow Christ. But it'll never be a religion. It'll only be based upon a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. Cut and dry. Understand, if you don't have that relationship with Jesus, at the end, where we talk about people going into the lake of fire, That will happen to you. But you know, he's made it so easy for us. He said, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord and the glory of God the Father, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the verse. He's made it so easy for us. It's not about the things that you do. It's not about your bad works. And it's not about your good works. It's about simply trusting in the God who came to save you. Confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart. And he did the rest for us. And he said, it is finished. Look, God is going to work his great plan out either way. Scriptures tell us that whether it's us as people who follow him or it's other people who don't follow, follow him, God is still sovereign overall, and he is still working out his plan in this earth with everyone. But you know how much greater of a plan it is for your life and a purpose for your life when you know Jesus and you're following him and doing the work that he has for you? There's nothing like it. Yeah, you can... Go out in that world today and not be a Christian and change people's lives in a heartbeat. But you understand, if you're a Christian and you love the Lord and you teach other people to love the Lord, that relationship, that good work that you did, that following God and what he had for your life, that won't end at the end of your life here. That will go on for all eternity. Leading someone to the Lord is the only thing that will change all of eternity. It's the only thing. Everything else just passes away. Look, our lives are meant to be lived for him. He's had a purpose for it. Step into what he has. Allow him to do what he has for you. Trust him. He's greater than everything else. He really is. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for what you did for us here. Lord, thank you for what you did for us even before the world began, God. And thank you for all the fulfilled prophecies, Lord. Everything you said was going to happen and it actually happened. 
that we can trust that what you say will happen will actually happen. I know I'm excited about it too. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for your work that you do in us and for us. You're so good, God. We love you and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Does anybody want to give their life to Christ right now? You can raise your hand. I won't embarrass you, but I'll call you up here and pray for you. Yeah. And we'll pray with you. Remember when I said, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, like that's all you're doing. And this is simply an opportunity to allow God's work to get started in your life. And a, like a profession of faith to allow the Lord to draw you in and do in your life what he has had planned for your life the whole time. That's all it is. Look, our job as Christians is to bring people into the church so that they could get saved and spend all eternity with our Lord, right? That is why Jesus didn't go into the temple and start dealing with all the religious people, right? He went out into the world and he started talking to all the people who he knew would come to him. That is what we're trying to do here. Because a relationship with Jesus Christ is the only thing that lasts. So is there anybody? Holy Spirit working in your heart? Feeling jitters? Look, I get it. I've been there. If you want to do it, now's the time to do it. It says, today is the day of salvation. You don't know what's going to happen out there. You could walk out right now and you could die and it could be over. But look, all you have to do is confess the Lord and you will get to be with him in heaven forever. Yeah, praise God. Okay, well, there's your homework for the week. Go out and tell somebody about Jesus, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, that's that's what it has to be. Like, if we're not telling them, then nobody's telling them, right? So go out and let the Lord lead you. Tell someone about the Lord this week. Tell someone about the hope that you have and the testimony that you have, the reason that you're in the place that you are. Because that's all of our story, right? We were one thing, and now we're something else. And the thing that happened in the middle is Jesus. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's go into our application time. If uh, This is a time just for questions, comments, Bible verses to bring up, something to draw us deeper into the study, deeper into the Word. And so that's what it's for. So just try to um, keep them short and to the point, and that way we can get to everyone. Um, but other than that, yeah, go ahead and shoot. Anybody? Don't be shy. Come on. I just think I want to piggyback on what you said. Yeah. I, uh, coming from a relationship at a very young age, the excitement that I got from it was just unparalleled, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it's just like, you know, it says in John, like, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to get to heaven and to speak with God and be in his presence unless you have that relationship. Yeah. God wants every one of us to have that. He says it here. He hopes that none of us would pass away, right? Mm -hmm. He wants us all to have the same opportunity. And everybody will. Yeah. I don't care where you're from. You should be in one of those far reaching corners of the earth. I guarantee you there's not a moment or a way that you can go yeah. where you die. So yeah. just press in, man. Just got to take chances. Yeah. yeah. Praise the Lord. That's so good. It's true. He never gives up. I mean, you guys have heard me t tell stories of the Lord reaching out to people like in their last days of life. And that's what he does. So, so good. So good. What else? Who else got something? Right here. Behind you. Yeah. The Lord has given me visions of you on a voice that he gives me dreams. Yeah. And um, the last time I talked, that I continue to walk my father with him. Oh, that's sweet. Are you going to tell us about it? Yeah. Okay, do it. <laughs> In my dream, I was looking up at the sky, as I do all the time, and I'm looking up, mm -hmm. and I saw my outward sky of sky and an intersection of the planes of the earth that are coming to us. Wow. So I'm 
I could see him at the funeral and just look back at him. Mm-hmm. Wow. And every time I think of him, you know, chills down my spine. Wow. That's so cool. What a blessing. Aw, that's sweet. Yeah. Got one up here. See. What you were saying about the relationship with the Lord, um, it was really amazing because um, when my brother was diagnosed in um, 97, um, he, because we went home and did the year of worship, he actually was singing, let me know more about uh, God so we could all know the way he lived your life. Mm-hmm. And he asked to believe that God would save us through his prayer. Wow. And then three months later, um, God took us home. Wow. But he was ready. Yeah. Because understanding that God's a central to a solid relationship with Christ, mm-hmm. that's what it is all about. It's not about the religion. Yeah. And I've said that on the, the grave site. Yeah. That's awesome. Because he was a great father, a supportive little boy, but he was like a mess of shame. Yeah. It blows me away about the people that don't know about Christ. Mm-hmm. And that I try to share as much as I can. And I, I tell them the jokes about, and then I get them to go to my YouTube channel. And <laughs> Where I, you tell jokes? Yeah. <laughs> I, I love I it. I tell jokes on my YouTube channel, yeah. and then they start laughing. And I even had to do high, and high school and college kids watching me now. Aw, that's I awesome. And I my jokes first, <laughs> yeah. and then I tell them about Bible verses, yeah. and then I tell them um, that I talk about the Bible, but only seven to ten minutes at the yeah. Longest, yeah. So that's I'm awesome. Praying God that God gave me the chance, and you know, used to be a missionary too. Yeah, for sure. What a blessing. So good. So good. Awesome. Got one in the back. Okay. Let me get you a mic here. Okay. Here. Take this. Talk into it because it's Jesus yeah. is uh, talking to the Father. He says, uh, For I have given them, in, I have given into them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou did send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. So, years ago, Jesus was praying for us. Wow. Wow. He says, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are uh, thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I ask, now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep thee thine own name, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Yeah. So Jesus is lifting them up, but he's also lifting us up because it's he's praying for them that for all of those who put their faith in Christ Jesus, mm-hmm. that they would see these verses that's written down, these five words that it's in your teachings that they passed on. <laughs> praying for us. Yeah. Wow. When I first saw that, I was reading NIV, and I said, I read that about seven or eight times. Yeah. And when I read it in NIV for the first time, it literally took on a meaning. Yeah. It didn't mm-hmm. have the these and the thous and all that. <laughs> That's so good, though. So, yeah. And in Romans eight, uh, Romans ten, eight through ten, like what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Thank you. So good. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Anybody else, real quick? 
already clapping? I'm just walking. You don't have to clap for me. Yeah. I know it was tough. It was rough. It was a rough one. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I like to Praise him. Praise the Lord. Thinking about um, that true Christianity is not only about the application of the scripture, which so many people claim to be religious or you know whatever religion, because they can maybe recite scripture. A lot of people can recite scripture. That's great. Yeah. And they know the ins and outs of their specific religion or um, sect or whatever mm-hmm. or Christianity, you know, whether it's Baptist or whatever, Catholic or whatever. But I was thinking uh, about the application portion and also how that the difference between what I would consider a true Christian and someone who identifies as Christian as a religion is a, is connection. Is the connection between them and Jesus and yeah. God, but yeah. also the connection between them and other people. Yeah. So that's really important because Jesus was all about that. Mm-hmm. Everything he did in his ministry yeah. was about that. Mm-hmm. From the lowliest of the low to the king. Yeah. And I got a little bit personal because he was right in front of me. Mm. It's okay. No, it's okay. Yeah. I spent a few days in ICU this last week um, at Auburn Faith. And um, I was just so blown away. I've been in the medical field on my I was actually going to go into um, go to medical school at UCLA, and that's where I had my fight in high school and everything. And you know, life happened and so I deviated of course, but I've always been involved in the medical field, social services and special education my whole life. And um, but these nurses, you know, medicine has an incredibly high burnout rate. You know, nur- nurses, oh my gosh, they have a really high burnout rate. And here here I am in the ICU, you know, I'm thinking about what's going on with the COVID and all this stuff. These nurses and I've worked with I've worked in all different levels of medicine, but they were so amazing, I can't even tell you. Wow. And two nurses, and they were the hands and feet of Jesus right then and there, right to me. Yeah. And to everybody, not just me, but to everybody. Yeah. And, you know, I kept, like, refraining from everything for help. I was like, oh, no, I've asked for help. And, you know, they were there, like, in a heartbeat. Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> I'm in a heartbeat. Just ready and willing to do whatever I needed, and, and always with just this generous heart. Mm-hmm. And the two that stand out the most are um, Kenny, and then there's that another nurse that they were both Filipino. And oh my goodness, they and I know they were believers because they were seeing you know we're praying for you. Wow. And I just I just was so overcome with just this this they the heart of service for these people yeah. that didn't know me. They didn't have any obligation at all. Yeah, the hands and feet of Jesus, and that's exactly what they were. And I think when I, and I'll be off the end here, but I think what I was thinking, because when you said that, it's just like, how? And I think what I was thinking is that, and I thought this for a long time, but it hit me really big when you were saying, well, Christianity is not just a religion, and that's so true. But we are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we never know when in a split second, we can have a two-second conversation or even yeah. smile to somebody. I mean, you wouldn't believe what is a smile can do to somebody yeah. to bless them. Yeah. And um, this is like the lowliest of the low to the highest of the high. They all need blessings and they all need a touch from Jesus, right? Yeah. And we are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus no matter where we are. Yeah. Amen. And so anyway, yeah, I so just good. wanted to elaborate on this. No, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, praise the Lord.